What's up everyone? Thanks for joining me today. This is an extremely special first of its kind video. In it, you'll notice I'm joined by World Rank 41, Sebastian Beaumalet. We took a very unique approach in this video where I actually studied his game from the recent Houston Open against Rafael Kandra. And I'm taking a coaching approach in which I highlight some of the opportunities and the strengths that I've observed and Sebastian talks us through several of those things. So it's sort of like a, a coach student style of video, although I'm obviously not his, uh, his full time coach. So credit to Sebastian and a huge shout out to Sebastian for coming on and being willing to explore this approach to add value for you guys. Now we covered a whole bunch of stuff. We talked about technical aspects of squash from movement to awareness to spacing and energy flow. We talked about some mental aspects of squash and outside of squash, the mindset that we need in order to excel and succeed. We talked about a whole host of things, so many that I, I can't even begin to describe them here. <laughs> Please take a look at uh, the comment section which in which I've laid out all of the timestamps for the different topics we discuss. If you like the video after watching it, please give it a thumbs up, please like it, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, leave a comment, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sebastian is super flexible and willing and open, so he would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. If you think that there's someone who would benefit from this video, please share it with them. The final thing I'll say before it begins is you'll notice that this video is a coaching style video and in it I am sharing a sample of some of the in-depth, high-performance, premium virtual coaching service that I offer. If you guys are interested in that, please send me an email at ahad at arperformance.com and we'll see if we are the right fit and if I can help you achieve your goals. All right, guys, enjoy the video and give it a thumbs up at the end if you like it. Take care. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you uh, to uh, welcome here today. Yeah, my, my pleasure. You know, it's funny, Sebastian and I actually chatted for the first time just a few weeks ago and I think he, he saw some of the YouTube videos Turns out that he is a very keen student of the game and was watching some squash on YouTube, reached out uh, one very kind of you to congratulate me, but then also curious to hear my thoughts about your game. That was uh, yeah. that was pretty cool. So I, I appreciate and I commend you for doing that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, your video is great and uh, I learned from it and uh, I will see uh, what you think about me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you're an amazing person. So that's the most important Thanks. thing to start off with. So the, the squash is secondary. Um, so my, my hope is through this video is to, number one, I want to celebrate Sebastian's beginner's mind. So that's the first thing I want to celebrate is, you know, he's a top, you know, top 50 PSA player. He has a fantastic coach and he's part of the French national team with uh, Renan Levine and all of the other guys over there. So, you know, he's, he's got a ton of support. He's got the mindset where he's constantly learning and growing. And I think that is the most important thing. So that's the first thing I wanted to do was just kind of celebrate and commend you for that approach to, to life thank I'm you. presuming and the game. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think like, uh, in everything, uh, we never stop learning and we never stop, stop uh, growing up. So that's my mind and uh, that's where I want to go. Amazing. And I think that's going to take you many places. So I'm excited to see kind of where, I hope so. where things I hope take so. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I wanted to also thank kind of your work ethic, your guidance. I wanted to congratulate you on that as well, because your, your work ethic, for, and we're going to get into this in the games, is fantastic. Like you, you never give up. Even if you're down, you you fight back. And even in the match that we're going to look at a bit with uh, against Rafael Alcandra from the Houston Open recently, you know, in the first game you were down seven one, I think, and yeah. you fought yeah. back from That's seven one. Funny. You know, a lot of guys would be like, "Man, it's game one. I'm down seven one. Maybe I'll use it to kind of settle in a little bit." But you were like, "No, I'm not just going to settle it. I'm going to fight for this, and I'm going to try to do my best." So you know, that's the kind of work I think I think that's going to take you a long way. And uh, in a minute. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's let's keep going. Let's keep <laughs> going over here. <laughs> now, no, guys. The, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, of course, of course. And for everyone watching, this video is the first of its kind in the sense that it's, it's a unique video because what we're going to do is I'm going to do with Sebastian a coaching style review of some of his game from round one again, Houston against Rafael Kandra. And I want to put out a note, a caveat here is that Sebastian and I have not rehearsed any of this. So I did some of this analysis on my own. 
it's truthfully the first match I've watched properly of Sebastian. So I picked up some things. I'm sure there's stuff that I missed. And I'd be really curious to hear Sebastian's thoughts like as we go through through the analysis. But you know, on this channel, I'm always trying to do stuff where we're trying to take novel perspectives, bring out more value for everyone that's watching. So Sebastian, first of all, thank you for doing this, not knowing what I'm going to say or share. Yeah, I'm appreciative. <laughs> right, take yeah, it. yeah. So no, I'm excited. I'm excited. So again, my intentions for this video are to hopefully help reinforce some of the things that Sebastian already knows about his game, his strengths, and possibly some of the opportunities that you have uh, in your game as well. And maybe we'll share some novel perspective. And even if it's not a novel perspective, maybe there's something that I'm going to show you that I'm hoping that will click uh, and help things kind of uh, suddenly the pieces of the puzzle might come together a little bit more. We'll yeah. see. That's my ultimate hope. Uh, otherwise, positive reinforcement is the key. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, the other thing, the second intention I have for this video is to give all of the viewers a flavor of some of the high performance virtual coaching that I do with a lot of people around the world. So I recently starting, started up my virtual coaching academy in which is all based off of in-depth video analysis. And in my, from my understanding, it's the first of its kind where it's all video analysis and it's extremely in-depth. We create reports, we do all sorts of stuff. So this, it will hopefully give you guys a flavor of what that's like. And I would be doing myself a disservice if I did not put a little sales pitch in here. So here comes the little sales pitch. <laughs> Basically, awesome. ev everything I do with the Virtual Coaching Academy is holistic. It covers technical, tactical, physical, mental. We create programs and structure around your training based on your goals. So I've created a system which basically helps people achieve whatever their goal is for squash. And we look at scheduling, nutrition, hydration, tapering, peaking, like all that kind of stuff, depending on whether you're a competitive junior player or you are a recreational adult player. Maybe if you're part of a team, some preparatory schools, there's some work that we can do together. And if you're a coach and you actually have students that might benefit from video, but you don't have the capacity and the time to do the video, there are some cool partnership opportunities we can look at as well. So if you guys are interested, send me an email at aha.arperformance.com and let's see if we can figure that out. I've also got the link to the Coaching Academy website on the page so you guys can check that out if you are keen. All right, let's move on. Number one, I'm going to start with the great stuff, Sebastian. So I think your mid and front court attacks are fantastic you really like to attack the ball from the mid court from the front court you play the drop the counter drop the volley drop straight and cross really really effectively yeah. i also think that you take the ball really early especially when you're going into the front court for the drop shots and uh, you deliberately kind of stretch forward and reach forward and take time away from your opponent so i think those are all like really really strong points in your game and i think and you, you know chime in whenever you want but i feel like that's a huge part of how you tactically structure your game. I think you love attacking and winning points in the front by getting on the ball early, quickly, and and attacking the person. Yeah, exactly. And uh, my quality is like I'm fast. Like uh, my leg is fast. I have a good movement in the front yes. and on the court. So uh, I want to use this in my advantage. Yes. And uh, like you say, like uh, when someone attack me in the front or the, or in the middle, mm -hmm. I want to play shift uh, quick and. Uh, just kill the ball easily. Yes, yes, yes. And I think, you know, it's one thing where a lot of people, they like to go and attack the front, but technically one thing that they do is their position sometimes is a little bit off. They're not, they're not reaching forward They're It's like that old school movement line, right? Where you go forward and then you go across. So you're trying to get beside the ball. And then when you're beside the ball, you, it's hard to take it early. You almost kind of end up taking it a little bit late. Or if someone yeah. goes up to the ball, even with like a, an aggressive angle, they end up taking it a little bit late. So it sort of defeats the purpose. So I think what you're doing really, really well, it's a great example for anyone watching. When we get to the clips as well, or anytime you watch Sebastian, he really reaches forward and takes the ball early. So his racket is out in front of him. So he's taking even more time away from the opponent. So I think it's a fantastic skill that you're, uh, you're leveraging there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I work on this with uh, Renan and uh, Olga Gazir, and uh, I watch a lot of players doing this as well. Yes. So uh, that's how I, I learned to do this. Amazing. But it's it's not it's not easy. Like we need to be consecrated in the in the judgment of the ball. Like if the ball we need to take it early or mm -hmm. or fall back. Uh, that's it. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, attacking at the wrong time is disastrous, right? Like yeah, uh, yeah. you either open up the court too much, or you put yourself in a disadvantageous position, try to do something that that's not really there, hit the, hit the tin, you know, whatever it might be. So uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Understanding the tactical context, understanding yeah. what the right shot should be at that point in time is definitely step one. Execution is step two. So yeah, yeah thank, thank you for mentioning that. Now, the second thing I think, which we've already talked about briefly, are just your movement speed and your explosiveness, I think is fantastic, uh, especially in the front. And you use your speed really, really well to attack the front. Uh, you also end up using your speed really well, I feel, to defend when you need to. But there's one thing, and we'll get to the opportunity side of it, uh, when it comes to just structuring the game and some of your shot selection, I feel makes you do more work than you need to do um so part of it is like we yeah, talked about last time right like the general accuracy compared to those really top top guys needs to improve a little bit based on our last conversation but there are a couple of shots uh, and i'm sure you're aware of this but if you're not hopefully this will be very eye-opening for you and we'll get to that i'm not going to spoil it i'm going to leave you hanging <laughs> until we get there <laughs> uh -huh. the the third thing that i thought was really cool was that you have a lot of variety from that front and midcourt so when you're attacking the ball, you're playing either sometimes a straight volley drop, sometimes you're looking for the straight volley drop, but then you kind of use the wrist and kind of cross volley drop at the last second. Yeah. So I think using those combinations is really, really cool. And breaking those patterns is really cool because, you know, you could hit that straight volley drop two, three times and the person's kind of going into that front left corner. And then all yeah, of a sudden exactly. it shows straight and go cross and then they're moving one way and then suddenly the ball's going the other way. And uh, I know one of the game balls actually you won against Kondra. Uh, I don't remember which yeah, game it was. Like it. Yeah, it was exactly uh, like that. I think the first game, yeah. yeah. Right, right. That cross yeah. drop came after playing a few straights and then he was nowhere. He couldn't adjust to it. So, you yeah. know, there are a few subtleties in that as well, which I'm sure you know about is it's the timing of that use and not overusing it and then bringing out the variation at a critical time. The guy almost yeah, has no course. chance to respond to it. Yeah, it's because he's not used to it. So... Right. It's a surprise. And uh, if you do it all the time, mm -hmm. he will knew and he, he will see your shots. So you need yes. to focus on where in the game we can use this uh, variation of uh, shot. Absolutely. So so give, tell me, tell me, actually, this is interesting. Do you consciously think about when to use that shot or does it just sort of happen instinctively through training? Uh, no, during, during my training, I'm uh, trying to... Uh, try every shot like uh, every time like uh, once i do a drop shot mm -hmm. the other time i drew a drive then cross court then bust and uh, after during the match i'm like okay i see where he is mm -hmm. and uh, now i want to do a drop i want to do a drop again and then the next time i will do a cross or or bust and like this he can he will be used to the drop and then just when he's used to the drop i want to switch and uh, and making me do a quest or right. something like this. Amazing. So how do you how yeah. do you train that skill? So I'm curious to know because a lot of people, first of all, most people struggle to even be aware of what's going on, right? <laughs> like they're they're kind of playing and they're just reacting and they don't know where their opponent is. They don't know what's working. They don't know any of that stuff. Yeah. So level one is obviously becoming more aware in general of what's going yeah. on. And what you're talking about is like next level stuff where yeah. you're saying, you know, I just played this drop. I played it twice. Now he's expecting the drop. So now I'm going to play the trickle boast or I'm going to play the cross kill or something like that. So to, to talk to me, if you're consciously aware of how you set that up in your mind, like how did you even train that level of awareness to get to that level? I think the first step is to do a good lens or mm -hmm. a good shot. And like this, you could uh, understand or you can anticipate the shot of your opponent. And uh, because you need to have time to do this, like uh, to make a shot selection, you need to be early on the ball and uh, stop and then uh, choose who to, where to play. So the first step is to have a good lens or a good ball. Like this, you can have time to go to the other one and uh, choose your shot. I think this is the most important before. Yeah, I love it. I completely agree with you. It all starts with length. It creates opportunity for us. It gives yeah, us time to get course. to the T and then creates the opportunity for us. Yeah. Um, now, when you have played the drop once or twice, are you keeping a little bit of a like a tally in your mind almost saying, I played the drop once, I've played the drop twice. Now, the th next time I'm going to play the trickle bolster, I'm going to play the cross drop flick or something like that. Are you keeping a tally or is it just sort of happening because of all the training? I think uh, now because of the training, I'm used to it. So it's 
I don't think about it anymore. Yeah. Uh, just I, I think about it in training, but in uh, during the match we can't really focus on this because we we need to be on 100 percent uh, on every every shot and every tactic. But right. I think it's now it's in my game. Like I yeah, yeah. Play. And in training, how did you do it? Were you consciously thinking about it in training? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So you would play two, three balls in one corner, and then you would try to mix it up on the third one. Um, yeah, yeah, either exactly. with drills or in condition games or something like that. Yeah, doing drills or individual session with uh, Renault or something like this. I will always try to try every shot, like uh, do every shot in every position like yes. this. I can learn how to do it every time. So that's amazing. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing, like, like one of the things that I try to teach all of the people through the, the coaching is this idea of setting an intention for each session. So, you know, you're going into your sessions, even based on what you just described with Renan, saying that you are deliberately practicing this shot from this position in this context, and then deliberately yeah. practicing that shot in that position for that context. And once you've put enough of those repetitions in, when it happens in the actual match, then it's just autopilot. You have, you have the file, you have the program in your brain that says, from the thousands of repetitions of hitting the drop from the front left when you're stretched out and the guys behind put that drop in uh, and then yeah, it exactly. sort of activates because of that deliberate practice i think yeah of course amazing amazing now the the last thing which i've also alluded to uh, again summarizing the great stuff about your game i think your mental toughness your work ethic your determination your attitude all of that stuff is fantastic you know i don't oh, i've you. watched that one match in depth i've seen highlights otherwise i don't see you quitting you know, some players will strategically maybe quit one game if they're down a few points and then they come try to fight back in the next game. I don't see you do that. Um, I think I don't see you really arguing with referees. I don't see you doing any of that stuff. So I wanted to congratulate you for that uh, sportsmanship and spirit. Thank you. But I think like uh, quitting, like we never know what, what, uh, we, what will happen. We never know how is the opponent. So I was like, okay, I did a bad start. So like, let's keep fighting. Don't give him any points and let's see how it goes. Like we never know uh, what, what will happen. Right, so, right. And, sp and speaking of starts, I was going to ask you this question later, but it's a good time now. Talk to me a little bit about settling. So, you know, you were down 7-1 in that first game. It looked like, well, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Talk to me, <laughs> talk to me about yeah. how you felt at that moment and, and the idea of settling into a match and in each game even. I mean, I had my tactical before the match, and uh, I was ready. I was I was feeling okay, but uh, I have uh, a bit of uh, misunderstanding, like in the court and uh, adaptation of the court, and uh, the ball was very quick then and slow at the same time. It was mm -hmm. hard to judge, right. and uh, just I'd, it took me a little of time to do this on every game actually. Right. And uh, after this, I was okay. Just focus on the basics, your lens, your accuracy. Then uh, don't give him any points and uh, don't give him space. And he came back, and I came back, and I fought, and uh, I won the, the first game. And yeah, that was cool. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, it it looked like you were a bit unsettled. It looked like yeah. you weren't seeing the ball as effectively. Like you mentioned, the speed was kind of throwing you off. It's tough to tell for on when you're not on the court, obviously, <laughs> that it's slow in some cases and fast in some cases. So that's a very interesting uh, interesting insight that you shared with us. Um, but, but you definitely looked a little unsettled. And, and some one of the things that I'm going to share may or may not be that relevant to your game because it was based on some of those movements you were making when you looked a little bit unsettled. So yeah. you can share feedback with me afterwards kind of uh, when right. we get there. Oh, that's perfect. So some of the opportunities... So the first thing that I noticed, and this happened a handful of times, was uh, your choice of hitting cross courts when you were under pressure, especially in, from the backhand, the back left corner. So it happened both when you were going open stance uh, and the ball was a little bit behind you and you're trying to force the cross and it was never accurate enough and it was always on Kandra's volley. Uh, and there was an interesting um, outcome, an interesting of effect of that which i'll show you in terms of Kondra's movement maybe you've already seen it i'm assuming you did a video review of this match with yeah i did i did I yeah did. yeah yeah. okay cool uh and then uh 
And then I noticed something with your two footed stance in the back left corner where I think there's maybe a technical opportunity. Uh, it looks like you're getting very close to the ball uh, in your two footed yeah. stance. So I think your spacing is a bit of an opportunity in, on the, in the two footed stance in the back left corner. Uh, you're forcing the cross and you're kind of ending up in this position where you're sort of leaning over the ball and, yeah. uh, and you're getting way too cramped and then you're forcing the cross and then people of Kandra's level are actually seeing those cues and they're, yeah, yeah. they're moving yeah. over for, for yeah. that ball yeah. on the volley. Yeah. So those are a couple of things I noticed um, just on the cross court aspect of things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming you're familiar with that. You're aware. Yeah. Of yeah. That. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. He he reads me very well on the cross court during all the match actually. Oh yeah. But, yeah, yeah. 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 But at the beginning, he did some mistakes. So I was like, okay, so he's just doing some mistake. Uh, it's okay. Just keep but going. Yeah. I, <laughs> he wasn't. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, that's the thing. If it's if it's working and he's making the mistakes, then keep doing it, right? <laughs> it's yeah. uh, it's as the I think the the perspective from the perspective I was hoping to share is if that is uh, either a tactical opportunity where you're maybe forcing the cross too much, or it's a technical opportunity where the cross isn't accurate enough the, because of spacing. When you play like Ali Farag or you know Shorbagi or any of these guys, they're probably not going to make that many mistakes no, uh, on sure. that volley so it's uh something to just kind of be more thoughtful of i know that's for sure they, they will punish me uh, yeah yeah um the the other thing so this is the one the second idea opportunity that i was going to share with you is kind of around your your t position um and the timing of your movement once you've hit the the drop in the front because you got and but this is where i think what you mentioned earlier about settling and the court and yeah. not being that comfortable i think yeah. that might have played into this um yeah. but it looked like there were several times where you were still kind of moving back not seeing the ball uh not seeing kind of Kandra's preparation and what shot and anticipating what he was going to hit and you got caught flat-footed several times uh when he countered you in the front court yeah. so I have to, and this is why I gave that caveat at the beginning. See, like this is based off of one match, so I have to watch multiple of your matches to be able to see the the trends throughout all of them. Uh, but based off of this match, this was uh, this was one thing that I noted as an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I knew like he did like four. He won uh, like three or four points with the counter drop in the yes. first game. Yes. So I was like, okay, I need to move my T. I need right. to. Uh, to be uh, up on the tee because I need to be ready to recounter or attack yes. after his counter drop. So yes, yes, and and the and the point that I was also going to make is that I noticed that you made that adjustment uh, in yeah. the second half of that game. You did make that adjustment, and for the rest of the match, actually, you didn't get caught as much yeah, uh, yeah. with that counter drop of his. And that's where that's why I had that question about settling because you were definitely a little bit uneasy when, especially in the first game. Um, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That's, that's great. I appreciate that context as well. Um, the third thing that I noticed as an opportunity was just your, and we've talked about this, so it, it also made it easier I guess, to note it, was just the overall quality of the length hitting where your, your length on average was a little bit shorter. Yeah. Uh, and it was kind of bouncing in the service box, your length and your width on average, not every time on average was a little bit shorter than say Kandra's yeah. was, or when you watch the Ali Farag and the Shobagi and stuff like that, on average, their length and their width gets a little bit deeper in, in the court. So they're more yeah. effective at moving their opponent off the tee. Uh, so, you know, with Kandra, he was able to cut off a lot of your shots kind of mid three quarter court at the back of the service box. Uh, you weren't consistently able to kind of get him yeah. off the tee enough. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, uh, we I watched it uh, twice, and uh, we watched it with Ronan as well. And was the first thing we saw like my lens, and I knew like my lens. I couldn't find my lens every time. I wasn't, it wasn't uh, constantly like, uh, and I was trying to find my lens during the game, during the match. But I don't know, the court was mm -hmm. hard for me to play on it, and right. uh, I couldn't find my lens like usual. And uh, right. With Raf Kondra, who is uh, good say, when the ball is not really uh, on the back or on the middle. So, yeah, that yeah. was uh, tough for me after. That, yeah, I don't remember who it was. I think it was Yusuf Ibrahim who was commentating on one of the matches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was your match. And he was, yeah. he was saying that the front wall was not glass. It was traditional, like traditional yeah, but exactly. colored. And then the rest yeah. was glass. So it was a little bit weird uh, playing yeah. off of that. Yeah, exactly. It was a bit weird. I've... Like for the glass court is 
normally is more faster than the, than the normal court. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one it was a bit slow. You, you will need to push hard the ball to get the ball in the in the back. Mm. And uh, so it, it was a bit complicated. I was right. Like, uh, yeah. And that, that's that's what makes squash fun, right? Like you always have yeah. these vari variables to try to decipher. Yeah, exactly. It's never the same. The, yeah. the, no, no, no court uh, is the same. And that's actually an interesting point for a lot of people is because a lot of people don't go and play at different clubs. They'll just play at their home club. So, And, and a lot of people who watch squash just think that, oh, well, you're in, you're inside this enclosed room and you're basically just hitting a ball. Like, how is it different? You know, like in tennis, it's easy to see the difference because sometimes you're on a clay court, sometimes you're on yeah. grass, sometimes you're outside, sometimes you're inside, there's the wind, there's the sun, there's all this kind of stuff. In squash, it's like, well, you're in an enclosed environment. How is it different? Well, exactly what you're saying. Tell, tell us a little bit about the differences between courts that you've noticed. I mean, uh, the floor, it can change every time. Like, uh, there's some floor is more bouncy and uh, somewhere uh, less bouncy and uh, the walls uh, the grass court if it's outside or inside uh, uh, if there is too much ac on the club or not ac at all so there is a lot of things uh, like this which change uh, everything right like, uh, every club is different like there is no uh, uh, except from a asb is almost the same because it's like traditional asb mm -hmm. but uh, yeah Interesting. Is, uh, we need to adapt ourselves every time. Interesting, interesting. Well, see, anyone who's watching this who has not played at multiple courts, uh, there are a lot of variables that come into it, even though you're on the same looking squash court. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. not the same squash court. <laughs> No, no, never. Other, other than the dimensions, it's not the same. And even sometimes the dimensions might not be exactly the same. <laughs> like at some clubs, you might be playing on a slightly, uh, or the walls are a little bit different. You know, there might be a funny bounce somewhere uh, because yeah, the exactly. walls are uneven. You know, that kind of stuff happens too. So, of course, of course. I mean, in Qatar, like the AC is is uh, really on like every time. You're right. So it's it's cold inside. Mm -hmm. It's really cold. So the glass court is uh, fast, but it's dead. Like right. when you do a drop shot or on the back corner, it's very dead. So, mm. so yeah, that depends. Like too many so, variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So t tell us. You know, it's obviously depends by, by who you're according to who you're playing, what your strategy is going to be, and it depends on this, on the court. But in general, if you're playing on a hot court where there's low AC, or you're in a hot country where there's no AC, for example, yeah. how do you how do you change kind of your high level strategy relative to if you're on a cold court uh i think i don't change too much like uh i like when it's hot actually okay for me it's i think i find my lungs more easily yep. and uh i am quick so I, I go quickly in the front and i just just go drop like what i can do every time now but yeah uh, but do you do you find your drops is it more difficult to put the ball away on those drops on a hot court it's more difficult but uh, like you can use all the string of the racket and mm. uh, make it slow so i don't know i kind of like it like this interesting interesting yeah. and and i think what one kind of mindset change that one that people almost have to make when you go to a hot court is you're not going to be hitting outright winners and then there yeah, are going no, to be no. short rallies. So no. you have to have a foundation of fitness to be able to back yeah, yourself exactly. up and you have to mentally be ready to say, okay, if I'm used to having for recreational players, five shot rallies on a really, really hot court, I might need to be ready for eight or 10 shot rallies. Yeah, and in yeah, your case, exactly. you might need to be ready for 40 shot rallies <laughs> more often, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So there's... I know. Uh, uh, go ahead. Like, go ahead. Uh, I, I like to, to play on this court because I know like the... My opponent like will need to be to do hard work to win a point because it's it's tough to do kills and right like the grass courts it's it's easier like to do kills uh kill shots even the drop is more harder to take it back and everything so right yeah but i kind of like it yeah oh that's awesome that's awesome okay next um opportunity that i have listed here i'm looking at my notes as we speak um yeah. i think you like i said you attack really really well from the mid court and the front court i noticed that the back court and maybe this was because of that court and this is where again i have to watch more of your matches to see but it's in that only from that match specifically you were not attacking at all from the back of the court and kind of like the top players obviously as you know set up 
again, to change patterns, they set up attacks from the back of the court, whether it's a straight drop or a quick boast occasionally or a cross court kill or whatever it might yeah. be. Um, I think there was one example in the fifth, later in the fifth, where you did try to hit one forehand drop shot out of the back, but you couldn't execute it properly in that situation. Maybe we'll get to that, maybe because you're mentally and physically fatigued a little bit or that you weren't seeing the ball as effectively as you normally do. But uh, is that something that you are consciously trying to work on? Was that a court specific challenge for you? What do you think? I think like uh, our, my tactic wasn't to attack first. Yeah against the uh, ref yeah. and uh, not on the back because I knew in, in the front is very good so I was uh, depend of who I'm playing and uh, I will more attack on the back maybe if I play other player I will not yeah. say who but uh, yeah, yeah yeah don't don't give away the secrets <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, depends on who I'm playing actually I can change my mind and my tactic and my way of attacking like depending on who I'm playing right Perfect. And you're, you're nice and comfortable with the execution and all that kind of stuff out of the back corners. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to improve it. It's not yeah. my best quality, but I'm still trying to improve it. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, and then the last opportunity that I've noted was just around some, um, maybe some mental lapses. So uh, right at the end, in the fifth, and maybe this was as a result of some of the fatigue that built in, maybe, yeah. I don't know, is, talk us through what was going on. Was it was it the physical fatigue? Was it the mental thing of being up two games and then suddenly battling it out in the fifth? What was going on at that point? Uh, at the end of the game, uh, I was, uh, I had the mental fatigue and physical fatigue as well because uh, I had to fight back a lot during the, the two first game yeah. to come back and to win it. And it cost me a little too much because I did a bad start yeah. and uh, that's that's cost me the match at the end because I was dead like on, in the fifth I was like feeling no more energy no more push in the head and uh, yeah I, I was tired I was trying to do something but I wasn't uh, really focused uh, not not focused but I was I wasn't really lucid like uh, yeah. I didn't know what to do actually yeah, you weren't, a, I guess you weren't as present as you were in yeah. the first couple of games where you were yeah. aware of everything that was going on in the fifth, you were maybe a little shell-shocked almost, right? Like yeah. not really sure what to do, what's working, what isn't working, that sort of feeling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I mean, it, it totally makes sense. <laughs> Let me, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen with you guys. And I've prepared a few clips and we can watch some of these clips together. And then uh, Sebastian, you can give us your feedback on uh, some of the things that I share. All right, perfect. Okay. Let's get this going here. Okay, so here are going to be some clips uh, where I noticed that you were sort of forcing that cross court from the backhand side of the court. So the first clip is over here. There was one little force that was a bit loose. And then you managed to reset and get back into the rally. So this was the first example that I wanted to share of um, some forcing. So falls a little bit, not really that far behind, not under a ton of pressure, but again, just the accuracy wasn't there. So, you know, yeah. Kandra was able to volley that ball. Um, I'll show you a few and then we can, we can chat about it. All right. The next one we'll see in a moment. There's another force uh, right on Kondra's volley. He missed it. And this was game ball that he kind of missed on that volley. And I know you mentioned this where he missed a few. So you're like, oh, I'll, yeah. I'll just keep doing it, right? Like he's missing yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> um, the, 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 key, the key note here for anyone that's, that's watching is Sebastian was consciously aware of a strategy and Presumably, if he hit a couple of loose crosses and Kandra punished him, he would probably shift away a little bit from the from the cross. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, exactly. But at the beginning, he, he did some mistake like this, and I think he's going to do another one after. Yeah, but... yeah, he, he made one more in this first game as well. Um, let's check out the next one. one. One interesting thing, and I'm going to show you more of this. Maybe you already saw this with, presumably you saw this with Renan. Um, before you're hitting the ball, Kandra's already kind of leaning over 
for the cross court because I think he kind of had a, like you said, he reads you well out of that back corner. Yeah. And I think because you were hitting a bunch of cross out of that back corner, uh, he was oftentimes sort of anticipating it. And then, yeah, lucky, lucky that he got that tin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's go to the next rally. So this was again, game ball for you. So the thing I was also pointing out over here was that you are, it looks to me, so there was one force cross, like you're consistently putting a little bit more work in than in Kandra because the because of the slightly looser cross or the shorter length. Yeah. There's another force over there which he put on. And then like it just it just opened up the court for him. And then a third one that he kind of missed over there. So you know this one, this one didn't do that much. This first one didn't damage you that much because you kind of just reset really, really well. So for anyone that's watching, even if you do miss hit or don't hit a ball as accurately as you would like, Sebastian did such a fantastic job resetting with that straight drive. And then he was back on the tee. So that that's critical. You don't want to try to force things when you're already under pressure. Uh, anything else you want to add to that thought, Sebastian? Yeah. The thing is like, for me, my tactic was to put it, put him uh, on his backhand as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So that's why I did a lot of cross court on this game as well. But uh, I didn't, uh, I wasn't accurate enough. Like, uh, and it cost me uh, after during the match, it was costing me like too much because, like you said, like I did uh, so much more effort than him during right. uh, the game because I wasn't uh, enough accurate yes. and uh, I had to defend like every time on the short, yes. uh, in the front, and uh, run a lot. and. Mm -hmm. uh, that cost me like uh, some uh, energy. In, right, right. Yeah, and, the, and this was the, the, the prime example for me was uh, this one, and I'll do it in slow-mo, where you're kind of putting that cross. Again, like you said, not accurate enough, but then, you know, basically two court sprints and then a third, almost a third court sprint. Again, if you had put that one down, um, yeah. it put that one up rather. It's just that that work is for everyone that's watching. That's the work that Sebastian's talking about that essentially ended up just piling up, right? It's it's uh, it's it just it's one on top of the next. Like you put in work, yeah, he recovers. He's super fit and he trains a lot, but eventually it catches up to you if yeah, you're exactly. consistently putting in the extra work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At the end, uh, it cost me like uh, like I'm human, like everyone, you know, I'm training, but uh... yeah. It gives me like some uh, energy, so that's why at the end uh, I couldn't like uh, recover every time, every time, every time, like uh, at the beginning. Right. Let me show you uh, another example here. Uh, I had a few examples of the cross, just uh, again, just the accuracy and then just the extra work that was put in. Here's one more. That one was a bit more accurate, so you didn't get punished for that one which was, uh, which was really cool. And if, and this is the thing, if those crosses were going in with that kind of accuracy, then you wouldn't have had to do yeah. that much more work the way you did in those first, uh, like throughout the match. Yeah. And, and then the result could have been a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If yeah. I had more lens, more accuracy, uh, I, uh, couldn't have to do like all this work to defense all the time. So, right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. For, for anyone that's watching, Perfect. remember length, length and fundamental targets. They are yeah. the key to squash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and adjusting to courts, like you said, not easy when, like we said, front wall is not glass. It's, it's a solid wall. And then you have glass elsewhere. It's just, it's difficult. Ball bounce is different off of each wall, right? Like you, if you don't get enough practice time and actually, since we're talking about it, I may as well ask you now, one of the questions I had for you earlier was and let me let me let me come back to the full screen here so we can see each other properly one of the questions i had for you earlier was around how you adapt to uncertainty because you know like in this tournament you were on the reserve list and then you get the call yeah. and sometimes the call could be the day before the tournament so how do you how do you adjust and adapt to that uncertainty being because a lot of players like i have my set training schedule i have my structure i have hard days, easy days. And then what if, you know, what if you had a harder day and then the tournament's the next day, or you've had three hard days in a row and the first match is next day because you get called at the last minute. Like, how do you, how do you plan for that kind of uncertainty? I mean, with my coach, like we are aware of uh, the situation, like, uh, 
if Renan and Thomas, my physical coach, uh, we knew like uh, there's, there was a chance to to be on the on the tournament. I was a reserve list uh, two, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, two. So I knew like uh, okay, uh, two. Uh, there's a lot of pullout in the last minute with the COVID now. Yes. And uh, so I was like, uh, okay, uh, I plan I fade like my uh, old training for this tournament. Okay. And uh, before, uh, like, uh, and it was like, uh, I think the end of the year. So I didn't uh, celebrate too much uh, during the new year. Right. And I had to do some tests as well, like uh, to be sure I can fly it if I'm, I'm in cold. Oh, um, okay. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of planning and thought even though Sebastian was not technically in the event. He, you went in planning, assuming that you would get into the event because of the circumstances. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like it was a, like a bet, but yeah. I mean, I'm training for it, so I need to be ready. That's it. I love that. I love that. And see, guys, this, there's a key takeaway over here is in life, you need to be setting yourself up to seize the opportunity when it arises. And by putting in the consistent work and putting in the consistent effort and being thoughtful about what you're doing, when the opportunity does arise, at least you're ready to seize it. Uh, a lot of people don't put in the requisite work. And then when the opportunity comes, you don't even recognize the opportunity. And then it's impossible to capitalize on it when you're not doing what you need to be doing. So again, credit to you and the team for, uh, thanks, for thanks. planning effectively and getting yourself ready to go out there and compete uh, at, at, to the best that you can do. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing that I always share with people is this definition of success by this uh, former, like a legendary basketball coach, a college basketball coach in the United States named John Wooden. And he defines success, and I'm paraphrasing, as the peace of mind attained by knowing that you did the best that you're capable of at any yeah. given point in time. Because at the end of the day, you can't control what that wall how the ball bounces yeah, yeah. on that wall you can't yeah. control if the court if you slip on the court you can't control how well Condra plays you can't control any of that the only thing you can control is your preparation your, and that includes your physical your mindset your rest recovery etc cetera, etc cetera. that's all you can control and then you go out yeah. and you do your best i totally agree like uh, like you said and like you said uh, for me it's the same like if i do my best uh every day I, in the quotidian and uh, all training in all training in the competition and even if i'm not going into the top 10 or top 20 but if i know i did all i could to be there yes like there is nothing more to say like uh, that's exactly it no i i agree with you so much and you know it's 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 i'd love to hear your thoughts on this our world now our society has become so deeply ingrained in one competitiveness which is which is cool because it helps you get better by constantly pushing yourself it's I, I like to think of it more as a growth mindset where you're always seeking to improve upon your your current level but there's this extrinsic drive this outward drive of train to be world number one and that's the, that's the main driving focus or train to earn x dollars a year or train to do this but kind of what we're talking about is a little bit different because we're talking about doing the best that you can every single day and then over time the outcome that's meant to happen will happen and you have peace of mind and you have no regret later in your life because you did everything that you were capable of how how have you tried to i guess have you ever felt the pull of modern society chasing numbers yeah, and chasing goals and how do you manage and, that and of course i was like this i was like not too far ago like uh one year when even one year ago like i was like well, you're a young guy you're for everyone who's watching he's only 23 so the fact yeah. that his mindset is already shifting is phenomenal so yeah right. like one year ago i was like uh i mean i want to be quickly in the top 20 quickly in the top 10 i want to make money i want to I want to achieve all of this quickly. I want to do this. I want to do this, but uh, life teach me like the, it's not like this. <laughs> you can't just uh, want a thing and uh, do it like this, and it happens. It's not like this. So, right. Just whatever happens, and uh, since I'm thinking like this, I'm playing better actually. Mm. And uh, whatever happens, and uh, just uh, try your best 
if you do all you can do in training if you know like you did everything you could like yes. there's no regrets to have so just be happy you know i'm, tr I'm trying to be happy in, uh, with this set of mind you know yes 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 and you know there, there's so many things i want to say so one question which i, I don't want to forget is you said life taught you this. I'm curious to know if something specific happened or it was like things that just kept happening and then eventually you sort of learned or was, has there been some awesome mentor or coach that helped you realize this? Um, so that's part of it. Let, let's start with that. Let's start with that. I think it's a lot of things. A lot okay. of things happens and uh, all of these things now put me in this set of mind. Like uh, I can't say too much of all these things because there was a lot of things happened, but okay. uh, so yeah, it's it's not only one thing. It's like yeah. bad things happen, then uh, you learn from it, and then you're trying to talk about it to learn, and uh, then nice. you try to you want to switch your mind, like what what can I do, and uh, that's how I'm here now. That's amazing. That's amazing, and I think it's funny, right? Because the the universe or God or source or whatever someone believes in when things are when things aren't going exactly how you want they kind of keep sending messages right there's, all, there's yeah, like a, little, yeah, exactly. a little knock on the door and then something happens that's that we maybe perceive as being negative but in reality that's that's like a the way i see it anyways and everyone has a different perspective um i see it as god or whoever knocking on the door saying hey wake up uh you yeah, know you feel true. it again the mistake happens you feel bad it's like wake up and yeah. it's like recognizing that everything is happening for a reason right there's this there's this idea and you know it's so funny when i was younger uh, i obviously never have played at the level that you're playing at right now um but when i started a lot later than you did but when i when i was playing uh through university and even after university i was competing kind of in canada provincially and nationally and anytime a tournament would come I would always end up like having a cold or a flu or having some niggling injury or something like that. And at that time, before I was aware, the way I, more aware the way I am now, I'm still not by any means enlightened or anything like that, but uh, the way I'm more aware now than I was then. And I always thought at that point, I'm like, man, this is just a sign of that. I shouldn't be doing this. You know, this is a sign that I'm not meant to be like playing as much or competing as much. And, you know, why is, why is everything against me and stuff like that? And only now later in life, after reflecting back, I realized that I was being driven by this limiting belief around scarcity and never doing enough and never being enough. And because I was driven by those beliefs, I was always trying to do too much. And that's why my body would break down either yeah. by getting cold or getting injured. And it's taken years to, for me to realize that through, you know, reading lots and listening to lots of stuff and talking to people and stuff like that to recognize that those were actually beliefs that I truly wasn't even aware of at the time that were resulting in those things happening. And I was, every, every time it happened, I wasn't thinking, Oh, it's my limiting belief. I was thinking, the world sucks and it's against yeah, me, right? Yeah. Uh, but it kept, it kept knocking on the door. It kept knocking yeah. on the door. And it took years of that happening until I recognized what was actually driving me. And yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Like for me, it's the same. Like uh, now I'm thinking like this more. Yes. And I know everything happened to a reason. Yes. And uh, even when I lose match, it's like, okay, I'm not ready to, to win this match yet. I need to work on the lot of things and uh, yes. it will happen maybe or not but yes just keep focus and keep trying and uh, that's it i love it man this is amazing there's there's an interesting definition uh of karma the the word karma yeah. you know like people yeah. like karma is uh, yeah, superstitious voodoo stuff kind of coming yeah. you know you do something something bad's going to eventually happen to you but karma is just the idea of cause and effect right so yeah. if i if i say if, if you and i are talking and I make a stern face like this and I, I start talking in like this authoritative voice. Yeah. What's going to happen? You're probably going to start thinking, what the heck? Why is yeah, this guy talking that? like that? Right. Like, why is he doing that? What, and then all of want? a sudden, yeah. Like, what do you want? Like, what are you trying to say? And then all of a sudden this wouldn't be this kind of loving free flowing conversation. Yeah. It would become very standoffish. Yeah. So the, the cause, which is me 
having that stern face and that voice of authority and all that kind of stuff has the effect of you maybe without even realizing it subconsciously tightening up and feeling confident like you're being confronted in a negative way and that is literally that's karma because yeah, i'm yeah. creating <laughs> the outcome that you are giving so you know when people there's this idea of in some philosophy around your thoughts creating your reality and that linked with this idea of cause and effect is so profound because if I'm having negative thoughts, those negative thoughts are going to come out in my action, my tone, my demeanor, and those negative things, which I probably, which most people don't even realize are causing certain things to happen for them in their lives, whether exactly. it's just in a conversation mm -hmm. or it's, you know, like the example I give people sometimes is you're, you're driving a car, someone cuts you off and someone, someone cuts you off and you can have, you can either choose like that you could either choose to start swearing and yelling and get angry and speed up and try to chase them down and if you do that suddenly your risk of getting into an accident goes up exponentially and your risk of injury goes up ex exponentially so that's like a simple cause and effect thing right there of you losing your cool chasing them getting into an accident conversely you could maybe say hey maybe that person's having a medical emergency or their family's having a medical emergency. And what if they're in a rush and they're trying to get there because they have to get to the hospital and, you know, something like that's happening. Well, all of a sudden you settle down and what could have been a stimulus that led your life this way suddenly becomes something that could be maybe even a compassionate or a grateful thing uh, yeah, and, and a positive thing, because suddenly you're now being grateful for the fact that maybe your loved ones are safe and healthy and that you're safe and healthy and there wasn't an accident. So I know I'm, I'm ranting a little bit. I'm, I'm rambling no, a little bit, but this I, is, I it's yeah. just such a profound thing to, to me. It feels very profound. And I, uh, yeah, for me as well, I, I feel you don't really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So no, fantastic. Okay. Uh, let, let's get back to the squash. <laughs> let me jump <laughs> back over here. Yeah. So I had a couple more examples of, um, you know, I'm not going to go over the rest of the examples of the crosses. What I will share is something that hopefully will be helpful. So what I did here is I just showed a little comparison of your movement into the back left and then yeah. uh, Mohammed Sharbagi's movement to the back All left. Right. That is perfect. Yeah. So over here, if, and we're going to slow it down. So to me, technically you guys look pretty similar, right? Like yeah. there isn't that much going on technically similar body angles, similar rotation, similar racket prep, uh, all that kind of stuff looks pretty good. The thing that happens is from a very similar position. And one thing that maybe the, I don't think it's the case here because the camera angle is a little bit distorted. So it's tough to tell kind of the spacing side of it. Um, but the shot selection is just different. And this goes back to your tactical thing, right? Uh, yeah. Against Kandra, you want to hit more cross. So maybe you're deliberately going cross because you don't want to hit like a weaker ball onto his forehand volley. Um, so that's probably what's going on. But I noticed uh, just throughout the match, it's not quite there for you when you're when you're kind of forcing that cross court. Yeah. And you just see Shorbagi, you know, Ali Farag volleys like like a monster <laughs> he volleys yeah, everything yeah. but shorbagi still going straight because he knows that he has a higher percentage and i this is my opinion i could be wrong in my opinion i think he knows that he has a higher percentage uh, of being able to just reset this ball effectively down the forehand wall on the down the backhand wall it, because he figures that if he goes cross unless it's perfect it's on farag's volley and if it's on farag's volley he's in trouble so this yeah. to me right like it's tactical stuff which we already talked about i don't know maybe it's uh, other than tactics i don't know if it's a confidence thing just when you're under a little bit of pressure if you're comfortable or not resetting that ball down the backhand wall uh but i'd love to hear your thoughts uh, uh yeah i totally agree with you and uh it should be in a, a, a drive like i could do a drive it would be better yeah. but uh i wasn't confident enough on myself on my drive at mm. this uh, stage of uh of the match like like because i didn't uh, have my lens on the beginning i was right. like i don't want to risk it mm. but uh, it was risky as well on the cross court right but i didn't want to risk it on a, on the on his forehand because he can do much on his forehand that on his backhand so that's why 
I was uh, eating cross court, but yeah, I should have definitely hit a uh, drive and uh, just reset. Right. The, we said they're ready there right right you know it's funny because i i honestly i do this all the time <laughs> and yeah. and i and i yell at myself in my head every time i do this because yeah. i it's a tendency for so many players right when we're under pressure we force the cross because we're we're scared truth yeah. piece, let's say it truthfully exactly. we're scared to hit the straight drive because if it's not good enough the guy's going to chop the volley and we're, we're, we're thinking sometimes it, well I, when we say we i'm saying me i'm thinking that oh maybe i'll hit a good enough cross and i'll and i'll catch him off and i'll, I'll win the point yeah. uh, or I something mean, like that but it never works right like yeah, or, it rarely works so i think uh it's it's cool that you're recognizing uh that you, you know we all have similar similar uh I shouldn't say faults, but similar uh, weaknesses sometimes where mentally we we know what the right shot is, but we don't do it because we're scared to hit it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. I mean, if you have the confidence on your shots and on every on your game, like your game can change really quick. Yeah. Like uh, you, you know what to do, but you're not confident to do it. So yes. you're just doing other things. Yes, and, uh, yes. Then you need to run and uh, to defend. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then that comes back down to what we talked about, right? It was because yeah. of these sorts of shot selections and co- lack of confidence that you got tired uh, at the end of the match. Yeah, exactly. All right. See, lots, lots of good learning, man. This is fantastic. This is exactly what we hope for. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so here's another one where I want to show you the... So here's a two-footed plant so two examples of you one of muhammad and here's where i feel like there's a technical thing going on with your two-footed plant i feel like you're getting too close to the ball your spacing yeah. is is off a little bit um and you can't fully see muhammad but you can see muhammad is yes he's absolutely bent from his waist but he's bent at his knees a little bit more as well and for me as a coach when i see this when I see the person bent from the knees and obviously bent this low, the ball is obviously very low. So you have to get down, but when the knees pop back, that tells me that you're getting too close to the ball and you're having to compensate by popping those knees back and shifting, shifting your, your bum back to hit the ball really close to your body. Yeah. So to me, this looks like a little bit of a technical thing because I noticed it on several occasions when you went kind of two footed in the back left uh hitting the cross court i don't know if you agree or disagree um, yeah i agree i think i think i was too close of the ball and i think it's uh when i look back it's my judgment mm. uh i think it's all like connected like my i didn't know where to play exactly yes so i was too close to the ball then i had to do a shot um, I think I'm doing a cross court there. Yes, and, yes. Uh, I think it's all connected. Like I didn't uh, know where to play the ball exactly, so I yes. was going fast to the ball, but too close. Then yes. I need to uh, to do I do a cross court because uh, that's why my mind think I am more confident to do, and yes. uh, then it make me runs. Right, right. And actually, one thing I do want to share, I know I said I wasn't going to show like a couple of those clips. There was one thing that I wanted to share because I thought this was really cool for anyone that's watching. Let me see if I can identify this uh, in the right clip. There was one clip that was really evident. So at the highest level, guys, like players are watching for cues when they're trying to anticipate where the ball's going. So they're watching body cues and then they're watching general player patterns and tendencies and stuff like that. So there's a lot of awareness and processing going on. Maybe not not consciously per se, but subconsciously because of all the practice. Would you agree with that, Sebastian? Yeah, I agree. Totally. So one thing that I found really interesting, and I think this is a good example, because you were hitting so much cross out of this corner, uh, and this is for everyone else watching, I'm assuming you're aware of this, watch Kandra's position. So before you yeah. strike the ball, he's already cheat, cheating over or poaching over like quite a bit. Like he takes a full step. And then after taking the full step, you hit, you hit the drive and then he comes back. So that to me was really, really, really powerful to show you kind of how much anticipation there's going on uh, from his perspective 
but then also how much maybe either lack of awareness or lack of shifting in tactics uh, from your perspective where yeah. he's, I mean, you can't see his body and you can't see his movement. The only thing you can feel is how early he's getting on the volley. That's really the only thing that you can feel and, and if you're hitting your target or not. So I, I'm just going to show that again for everyone. Like contact has not been made and then it gets made and then there's like the full step. But the other thing this made me realize, and this goes back to your point about you really struggling to find your length, your weight of stroke on this court is, you know, like, and this is, this is not a critique against you. It's just such yeah. a, it's an example of the fact that you could not find your weight of stroke is that Kondra moved like a full step in the wrong direction, but he was still able to take that one step back and cover, yeah. cover the drive because it popped off. Like you weren't like, that's just an indication guys that Sebastian was not able to find his length on exactly. the day. Um, nothing against Sebastian. It's, it's the court, it's the confidence, it's all of that kind of stuff. But um, I thought, I thought that this was a very interesting clip to review. No, oh, exactly. I mean, I mean, I did some uh, mistake and I like, uh, it's the difference between uh, like me top 50 on the world and the top uh, 10 and uh, top one and uh, the difference like they will be able to adapt themselves quickly yes. and uh, to adjust like every tiny thing like this uh, during the game and that's where I want to be and uh, yes. it's uh, great that you're showing up because I totally agree with you like I should have been able to even with the court like adapt myself better yes. to it's better lines and to have more accuracy and then in the game as well to feel like is uh, anticipating too much my cross court mm -hmm. and to stay more uh, straight and but this is like with the experience i think like we can uh, achieve that with the experience and with the match and uh, training and just keep trying yeah yeah that's exactly it man and that's the mindset right it's just keep trying you yeah. the fact that you're yeah. doing these analyses with Renan and, and the team and you're you're aware of all these things then you can basically sit down and say okay well now i know these is these are some of the things i need to work on in addition to whatever else you're working on and then it's about yeah. okay what do i need to prioritize and then let's get it done and then yeah. the, just by competing more and playing in different conditions you're gonna you know you're just gonna get yeah. that experience yeah, and the opportunity yeah. to practice it then yeah, you're right. Exactly. I need to see everything, like all the uh, all the possibility to learn and then uh, to be able to do something about it. Yeah, exactly. And and that's that's an art in itself, right? Is figuring out what is the thing to focus on first. What should yeah. I spend my time on? Uh, and I'm I'm gonna put a little pitch in for what I do. That's part of what I do with the coaching is help <laughs> people figure out what to do first and what to do later because there's some things that are more like I, I just say bang for buck or low hanging fruit. It's like what do we go with first because it's gonna be most effective, probably the easiest change to make as well. And then after we build those quick wins, then we go to some of the deeper stuff. Exactly. All right, let's let's move on. So this one again guys is contextual sebastian has already told us many times he was not really settled the way he would ideally like to be settled and he wasn't seeing the ball and the speed of the court and the front was different from the back etc cetera, etc cetera. so lots of things going on um but over here some of the things that i noticed were you'll notice that when sebastian goes short you're not reading the ball uh, and kind of Raphael's. um stroke and you know and this is and you can you know i'd love to hear your thoughts on this i i'm going to share my perspective for people that are watching you know like when you're coming in from that position you play the drop you you often want to be watching kind of the opponent's setup and their position so in this case rafael is coming with a pretty low racket prep so he doesn't really have too many crazy long attacking options from that position would you agree with that uh i agree but i know like uh from this position, you mm -hmm. can do like a boast, yeah. a, long, a cross court, yeah. and a jump. Like when you play like player like this, yes. like with a short uh, preparation, they, right. they can do so much. So that's why I was like a bit, I'm not sure what you can do yet. Unsettled, so, right? Yeah. Right. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. 
um yeah and the better player you play the more options they possess <laughs> from yeah, the yeah. shorter swing <laughs> so it's that and and that's even more reason to really emphasize getting our counter drop stuck to that side wall yeah. because if we can stick our counter our drop like your drop in this case onto the side wall well now you've limited the options the boast is going to be really hard yeah. if it's stuck yeah. to the wall it's impossible if it's stuck to the wall uh the straight drive is possible but it's a hard squeeze the cross yeah. is almost impossible if the ball is really tight to the wall it's impossible a little bit of space possible but high risk uh counter drop is really the only option so the the tighter the ball gets you just narrow the guy's options and then suddenly exactly. your ability mm -hmm. to to cover it improves exponentially and we have and I have an example of that later well let, let me show you that example now i think this is uh i think this is the one nice tight ball glued to the side wall and in this case let's slow it down so guys check this out so sebastian's coming in plays a nice counter the ball is right there on the front wall that squeezes into the side wall just like what we were saying and when Kondra is getting it not only is it fading but it's tight to the side wall and in this case your t position was adjusted and you're far higher up because you know that his options are limited based on the amount of yeah. pressure he's under and the tightness of the ball so for everyone watching this is awesome right because previously when sebastian's drop was a little bit looser Kandra had many opportunities and Sebastian was unsettled. It was also earlier in the game, so a little bit less settled. Over here, tighter ball stuck to the sidewall, opponents under pressure. Sebastian pushes his T position up and he's ready to cover the most likely shot, which is going to be a little fluff up counter drop over here from Kandra, almost like a defensive drop from Kandra. And then Sebastian can attack it from there, which let's see, there's the little fluff up. And there's the cross court kill, which was executed fantastically just out of his reach second bounce fading into the side wall so you know that that was uh that was an example of the tight counter drop minimizing yeah. options pushing the t position up to cover that and then attacking the next wall the, exactly right the, the one interesting thing that Kondra did and I, I i made a video of this once before about joel macon with the defensive drop see when he's under pressure he's not trying to counter with like a super super tight ball because yeah. he's going to he's going to take even more time away from himself and it's a high risk shot. So the ball that he hits is just a pop up onto the front wall. It's literally like a short lob. I just called it a defensive drop. I don't know what else you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, good. that's a good name. But you know, what does he do by the time Sebastian's hitting Kandra has given him himself enough time to reset onto an appropriate kind of floating T position. Um, so just a really good skill by Kandra and really good tactical awareness but even better execution by by our man over here so uh well <laughs> well done yeah thanks i mean if i didn't had the perfect like uh cross court uh, kills yes he'll, uh, he will have it like uh because right. of this because of his uh, defense slope yes like uh, he will have it Sure. Yeah, exactly. The defensive drop basically just neutralized his position. You had to execute a really, really good ball. If he had played yeah. a lower, slightly more attacking drop shot, and if he missed it even a little bit, he would have been so far out of position. And then yeah. you could have done anything on that side with like he basically by doing this the way I think of it and correct me if I'm wrong, the way he hit this is almost in some way putting the pressure back on you because he said, yeah, here, yeah. take this ball now hit something good and let's see if you can win the point as opposed to him trying to attack it and then giving you something loose and then you being able to put away like a relatively weak ball yeah exactly exactly it was like now uh, i need to do a good shot because uh, if i'm not doing this i would uh, you will get uh, the yes. ball back and uh, maybe uh, make me uh, or reset uh, the, the the rally so yes yes exactly exactly no amazing all right, I'm not going to dwell more on the T position and the drop because I know you were unsettled, but this is this is a good discussion to show uh, this example. Yeah. The next thing, and again, this might again be because of the court. I felt like the backhand volley, like I said, short, really, really good. Backhand volley deep was uh, a little bit shaky. Probably just this match. Again, I need to watch more of your matches to see um, if that's the case. But let's see it here. So here's an example just like of missing the target, obviously. Um, yeah, this is, I won't, you go ahead. 
I wanted to put it uh, way way more in the back uh, the wall. Right. Like, uh, but yeah, I don't know why uh, I couldn't find any lands in, in this match. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is a yeah, I, you know, I tried looking at this clip for example technically, but I didn't, you know, like there was nothing really technically wrong. Um you, yeah, you just kind of obviously the obvious one is you're just hitting way too low, right? Um but then there's a fine balance because if you are in a somewhat attacking position, if you hit the if you hit a got nice fading length, that's your point, hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so the risk is you don't want to go too high because if you go too high, he, he he's back in the rally. But if yeah. you go too low, then this is the, and this is actually what you did here is kind of I'm guilty of this all the time, <laughs> and, and other people are guilty of it. I'm sure even more than I am uh, of hitting the length really short in the court. So you know when the ball lands in this no man's land position. Yeah. you're really kind of screwing yourself over because now you've given the guy, especially a guy like Kondra from here, he has the boast. He has the cross drop, a cross kill, a straight drive. Like he has anything. Yeah. So, you know, like that's not a position you want to be in, but uh, you know, there were a couple of examples of the, of the backhand volley. I'll show you uh, one more. Yeah, I totally agree. My backhand volley wasn't, uh, wasn't good enough. I mean, all during all the match, uh, right, but it's it's not my greatest uh, strength as well. But uh, right. it depends depends actually because sometimes I remember sometimes where I was feeling okay and uh, I was playing good at it. So it depends. Yes. Hmm. Well, one actually even before we go to the volley, I want to show people this one because we talked. This is what I started off actually when we were chatting about Sebastian, your awesome ability to take the ball moving directly at the ball and stretching forward and getting an early contact point to take even more time away from your opponent. So let's show people how you do that so effectively. So first thing, big stretch going straight at the ball and yeah. look at that arm extension guys, like extending all the way forward, taking that ball way out in front of him. And if he gets that somewhat accurate in that front corner, your opponent has to do so much more work because if he yeah. didn't do this and he took a shorter lunge and hit the ball kind of in line with his front foot, He's just given the, his opponent a fraction of a second more to get settled and to push forward for the ball. But by taking it here, he's taking that much time away from his opponent to put even more pressure on them. So exactly. fantastic skill. Thanks. That's the that's the main thing. Yeah, that's my mindset. Like uh, making in uh, making in do a lot of work, like with my counter drop. Right. And, uh, yeah. But and the thing and the, the thing that people forget is that. Like this takes a lot of energy for you <laughs> because yeah. you have to accelerate onto the ball, which yeah. uses energy. You're not just cruising onto that ball. You're accelerating. You're yeah. getting low in a deep lunge. You're fully stretched out. So you have to use all of your muscles for balance and stability. And yeah. you have to then push out of that, which takes a lot of plyometric strength and power as well. So, you know, there's a lot going into that movement right there, uh, which is why it's so impressive. Yeah, because I need to go fast there and uh, at the same time to be uh stabilized and yes. uh, then uh, going back uh, quick as well uh this is the fitness training like uh just uh let uh, make your body like uh, doing this a lot of time like yeah. good stretching and uh like the muscle uh, work from the self and uh, that's it well tell us a little bit like because one of the questions I had earlier, I love this, man. We're just, we're just going through it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not even having to ask questions. It's just coming naturally. Um, speaking of which, this is kind of like that idea of flow that everyone's looking for, right? Uh, getting in the zone with whatever you're doing. And it could be on the court, off the court. If you can get in, in the zone in life in general, uh, everything becomes more enjoyable. Yeah, but of course. Speaking about fitness. So you mentioned fitness. How do you, did, did your, let's actually come to the bigger screen here for a minute. Did your strength and your speed and your power, your explosiveness, was that something you kind of had from a young age? Is it something that you had from a young age, but then you've trained a lot to harness and, and utilize even more? Uh, tell us about that. Uh, I think like I have some good genetics. Like, I don't know, because I'm black or I don't know, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I don't, I, you no, know, that, that used to be a thing all the time. I don't think it's the case, but nah, I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah. So I have a good genetics, but yeah. uh, my dad, uh, trained me a lot on this. So he developed as well, uh, those genetics. So yes. 
that's why now uh, I have a good like uh, backup on this, and uh, I know like even uh, I didn't train for a long time. Like this, uh, I won't lose it. Like it's right. It's now, uh, it's now on my on my genes, you know. So right, right. And uh, what now with my coach Thomas and uh, and right now we just like trying to keep my uh, fitness like it is actually and uh, don't get injured as well right that's the main thing right right yeah because your fitness is not the thing that's losing you the squash games uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so and that's that's an interesting point because a lot of people and i'm assuming do you enjoy fitness training yeah i do depends i'm doing a lot of bike actually at the moment yeah. i'm not too much of a biker but uh, that's what i need to do so i'm doing it Okay. Okay. Very cool. Tell us more about that in a minute. But one, the thing I was going to say is that a lot of people do the things that they are good at because they enjoy doing the things that they're good at. Yeah. But the yeah. reality is that you need to maintain maybe the things that you're good at, but you really have to work on the things that you're not good at. The things that you don't want to do, that's the thing that you yeah. need to do. So yeah, it's, exactly. Like, right. With Thomas, like when I'm now trying to be more stable because I'm quick yes but uh when i'm going like in the front i need to be stable to play a good shot so yes. and this is like we can say like boring stuff like uh to to work on like in the fitness session yeah like uh all the muscle but like deep back in i don't know what we say in english but uh, actually but like all the profound muscle, like uh, all like all of your core muscles, your st your yeah, stabilizing yeah. muscles through your core. It's not the muscle, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is like stuff I don't love to do it, but I know I have to do it to. It will. Uh, so. That's exactly it, man. Because it, when you're doing that kind of work, you know, you're doing. I'm assuming. Uh, I don't know what your workout looks like, but I'm assuming you're doing a lot of like cable band work to stabilize your core you're probably doing yeah, a lot yeah. of balance work and stability and movements and on single legs and band work and single legs and muscle yeah. activation and stuff like that right yeah all this stuff like this yeah and the thing is with that kind of stuff you don't get a sweat you don't break a sweat your heart rate doesn't go up uh you know you don't really it doesn't yeah. feel like a, not the same way it doesn't feel like a way. workout yeah. right yeah. like uh, you're used to going and just busting it out and getting crazy yeah. heart rate and just sweating and working so hard and stuff where this isn't quite the same uh like when it comes to a workout so yeah it's, it's different different like it's not the same session we don't yeah. walk with the same muscles the same thing right. but it's it's so it's so important it's so yeah important. absolutely i think you know go, going back to that point of people don't like doing the things that they're not yeah, good at and people like see the thing is like a lot of people love exercising because it raises the endorphins because they start sweating because they they're you know they get they feel like they did a hard workout and that's totally normal and it's natural but these kind of sessions they're so much harder because you don't feel that same pump uh as though you get from a hard squash yeah. match or like a bike session or uh ghosting or whatever it is right no, no, no. um but they're so important because and and you can tell me about your opinion on this too like from a fitness perspective you know we you mentioned it which was awesome is you talked about stability uh, it's there's stability but there's the the part that people miss is that there's acceleration to get onto the ball but then there's deceleration yeah. when you're on the ball and then there's another acceleration to get off the ball. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people get in the gym and you'll do box jumps, for example, for plyometrics yeah. and power. Yeah. But box jumps are only training the acceleration phase and they're training it vertically. We need to train laterally and, and horizontally. Box yeah. jumps are training acceleration. They're not training the deceleration part because you're just landing softly and you're basically jumping on a box that's just high enough. And then there's very little force coming onto that box to decelerate your muscles so yeah. in i don't know how much of this you do but a lot of oh, static holds or a lot of slow movements so like if you're doing a lunge you want to like slow your way down into the lunge maybe even with like heavy weights or something like that because then you're working on the eccentric decelerating component of the lunge yeah and exactly. then the, the power out is a different story but people neglect the deceleration and they only focus on the acceleration yeah, because I think it's more enjoyable, like to jump and. Uh, yeah, it's way more enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, 
but uh, that's what you say is true like uh, for me i know like i do a lot of time uh, skating you know skating like with Very a cool. big ball and yeah. like uh, six or six kilos and okay. then just jumping on the back nice. on, uh, on the left on the other right yeah and yeah. just doing this like stabilization and then just moving the back way and like this you push then but then you stop yes stabilized, and then you just push and then you stop amazing on one leg every time and that's yes. uh, amazing yeah so like that's that's awesome that's a whole uh the speed skater kind of jump and you're always going yeah. one leg to the other and you're adding that x with the ball so anyone who wants to try this don't try it with the ball first uh yeah. the ball yeah. adds yeah. even more force and momentum which you have to then decelerate and stabilize on the single leg on the other side so you gotta first do it with just body weight and just see if you can jump side to side and start with smaller jumps uh, and you're balancing and pausing on each side and then increase your distance and then add uh and then add the ball so we always have to exactly. work through like appropriate progressions and regressions we are talking to a, a professional athlete here guys so don't don't do everything yeah. that he's doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's my job so uh, yeah yeah I'm exactly exactly no that's amazing and what what are some of the kind of the stability sort of exercises that you do is it similar to what i mentioned with the bands and the single foot balance uh, and stuff like uh, that i think there's a lot a lot of i'm doing a lot of different exercises mm. with uh, both you as well yeah, yeah. Uh, bozu with elastic as nice. well. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of exercises like my yes. coach fans. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Is do you have a favorite or a least favorite? Maybe the least favorite is the best because that's the one that you need to do the most. <laughs> uh, a least favorite. Uh, I don't know. I think there's too much. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say maybe you just love training so much that you don't even have a least favorite. <laughs> No, I love training. I love training, but now I know like I'm doing a lot of things that I'm not enjoying it too much. So, for example, I'm doing a lot of bike, but yeah. I'm more like a runner. I like to run. I I don't like too much bike, but for my body and uh, yeah. for my integrity, like bike is better. And uh, because in squash we use a lot of energy and uh, it's yeah. out for the articulation like for the knee and uh, yes. everything so the bike is better to to keep the knee safe and to train as well the cardio and right, everything right. so right so i'm doing a lot of bike but <laughs> i rather i rather go run and, and just run did you do totally random when you were uh, younger or maybe in high school and stuff like that did you ever do any track track and field sprint stuff uh i didn't too much this uh but i was running a lot uh not on like the court but uh, running a uh, longer longer distance or a sprint yeah. sprint distances longer distance was, oh interesting yeah. like yeah. what uh almost uh the goal was to do 10k okay but uh i didn't do it i didn't do it uh 10k i think i did the 7k or maybe less but uh my physical session was on this a lot of okay. time and did you just go try to go fast for the full five seven k? No, no. My dad uh, trained uh, trained me like this. Like uh, he wanted to me to do the ten k on uh, less than thirty five minutes. I think so. Forty five or thirty five? Thirty five. Thirty one. Well, that's that's pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty fast. So I was training uh, interval training, like I uh, doing like four hundred meters. Yeah. Then uh, rest ten minutes, uh, ten seconds. Then do it uh, four hundred meters. Wow. And then, yeah, ten seconds is almost like no rest. <laughs> almost, but in squash we don't have <laughs> lots of, uh, of time between between. Uh, yeah, between rides. So yeah. 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 And what what kind of bike sessions are you doing these days? Like uh, long long session, one yeah. hour and a half, two hour. Like, oh wow! Uh, okay. Outside, and uh, if I'm not doing this, I'm doing what bike interval training in the white bike so amazing yeah oh now i'm curious man so tell, tell me like what sort of power power output are you guys training at like you and the team and stuff like that on average like if you get on a white bike are you are you doing intervals for a minute at like 400 watts at 300 watts uh like what kind uh, of stuff? actually i'm not looking at all at the watts i don't oh, okay. know i don't know i don't know oh, what, uh, how many watts i develop okay but uh i'm on the bpm and uh and uh shift uh, uh, so, uh yeah so, what, so like what kind of so i guess every session 
sometimes you might do like an aerobic session. So your BPM is lower. Uh, when you do like yeah. sprints intervals, you're really targeting like a higher BPM and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so normally I'm doing aerobic session with uh, my back outside. Yeah, and, that makes uh, sense. With the bike, I'm doing the interval training. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, I'm doing a lot of uh, 30 seconds, 20 seconds uh, rest. Uh, and I'm at uh, resistance three, not two. I don't know. Okay, if okay. Yeah, well, I'm not familiar with the watt bike's resistance. Okay. I am curious. Yes. The next time you go, tell me yeah. if you know the actual watts. Tell me what kind of watts you're pushing out. I'd be curious okay. to know. Okay, I I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, I've used. Uh, have you used those assault bikes before? The ones with the arms and the legs no, and it has I a big fan. Yeah, I know this. I know the CrossFit guy is a yeah. lot of them. Yeah. yeah yeah that thing's pretty hard and that thing also shows you the because the watts are like a universal measure for yeah. resistance right uh okay. with res re resistance levels every piece of equipment is different yeah so for the, the watts are cool for that reason because it's like okay wow if someone's pushing out like a thousand watts for example it's like yo that, that's, okay. that's a lot of power <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know uh so it's interesting okay yeah. cool that was a nice little detour for a minute let's go back yeah. to uh, a little bit of the squash again <laughs> Yeah, um okay so here we were we were talking about this um and sebastian's movement we were going back to so we were looking at the backhand and i know you said the backhand volley deep wasn't necessarily feeling good this was just another example and over here after you hit that i saw that you were like man i should have hit that drop <laughs> so yeah. you, you, you kind of you didn't want to yeah. hit that drive but it was just uh, another example of it being a little bit off on uh, that day unfortunately yeah this this makes me crazy man yeah. Uh, yeah i think like i was wanted i knew like he's gonna cross and yeah. i anticipate too much mm -hmm. and then i was too close to the ball yeah exactly i just hit on myself and i was like you just want to play too fast and uh right and i should have played a drop or just a straight kill or just right just not on myself and yeah because you better yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. One of it's this thing I share with some of the students is technically this was a loose ball. Technically, right? Yeah. It's, um, by any standard definition, the ball is coming like right in the middle of the court. It's on your volley. So anyone would categorize that as a loose ball. But the thing that I try to encourage people to think about and tell me if you agree with this or not is the ball is really only a loose ball if you are in an appropriate position to attack it, for example. Yeah. Uh, it's It could be here, but if the ball is like, let's say it was a foot higher and you're jumping, you're leaping out off the ground and you're trying to volley and you're trying to attack it from that position, it's not really a loose ball then. <laughs> in fact, you should be moving back and yeah. respecting the fact that Kandra, let's say, hit a good enough lob or something like that, and then reset it from behind if you're not in the right position. So. I think this idea of defining a loose ball, a loose ball isn't just a ball that comes in the middle of the court. It's only going to be loose if you can shift your feet and get in the right position early enough. You can get your racket set early enough. You have the options to hit whatever shot you need to hit to attack it. Uh, and you're choosing the right shot at that time based on the preparation and the context. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Like the loose ball is like uh, a shot, but you need to focus more than I think every shot to play it because it's the, for me, the more complicated shots uh, because you always need to be 100% focused to play it. And at this time I wasn't, right. and I, uh, I wasn't ready to play it and I wanted to play it as any way, but it cost me the, cost me the point. Right. Right. Yeah. Very, very good lesson. See, and guys, top, top 40, top 50 players still make the same mistakes, right? Uh, the, yeah. the thing is, the thing is, the better you get, the fewer those occurrences yeah, exactly. become. Yeah. Yeah. Like Ali Farag, you might watch him do that, but he'll make a mistake like that or something, maybe once a match or uh, once every few matches. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not regular. Uh, exactly. Let's, let's check out another example here. So again, like a tough one on the high volley. That's that's a pretty that's a super hard serve. <laughs> you, have that well. you have you have a good serve. Yeah, he has a really good lob serve, and especially this one, because it's like just about to catch the wall, super high. Maybe yeah. it was even you were get, getting distracted with the lights, maybe as well with the yeah. white ball and the lights, yeah. right? Like there's so many factors there. But this is again goes back to that um, confidence thing we mentioned. 
because maybe the right shot wasn't the cross when you're under pressure. Maybe it was a straight yeah, and just straight. resetting it. Yeah. Right. So it's a uh, interesting kind of playing the wrong ball and then he put you under a bit of pressure, but you managed to reset. Um, so the last, I think this is the last thing I had in my list of highlights was just around some shot selection and mental fatigue. And we've talked about this. So I'll just share a couple of examples. Let's see here. Super under pressure, but playing the cross court flick, which then messed you up for the rest of the rally. So, you know, what, what do you, well, talk, talk us through your thoughts on this one. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I was a bit off on my mind. Like, uh, yeah, like you say, mental fatigue and uh, right. I should have played for me defensive, defensive drop or even a lob. I didn't do enough lob for me on this match after we watching it. Right. Uh, I did a lot of counter drop, but uh, if my counter drop wasn't effective enough, he was he was there and uh, he was hitting me hard. So I didn't do enough lob on the front, yes. even a straight lob or cross court lob as well. But uh, right. yeah, this. This wasn't the good choice. Right, right. And how do you think about the lob? Like, uh, how, so one, th I want to get your thoughts first. How do you choose whether you are in a good enough position to hit the straight or cross court lob versus only having the counter drop? Uh, I think for me, the lob, like, the lob is an attacking shot if it's if it's well executed. Right. And uh, it depends actually. Uh, on uh, where I feel the, the guy, like if I feel he's uh, right behind me and he's waiting for the counter drop and to can directly and do a cross or drive. Yes. Uh, like, okay, I can defense, take my time and uh, just breathe and uh, reset the rally or even sometimes uh, just make me in a position where I can attack after. So depends depends on the situation and my opponent on the way he's, Oh, we, oh, I feel the game actually. Right, right. And how do you feel like one thing that I tell my students sometimes is if you are under like 10 out of 10 pressure in the front corner, the only real shot that you should be thinking of in my mind is a counter drop. Because if you're yeah. under that much pressure, you don't have the time or the space or the capacity to get your racket under the ball and execute a lob effectively. Um, yeah. And if you can't get your racket under the ball with those open face and all that kind of stuff, that lob is going to pop up right in the middle of the court. It's going to be short and then you're screwed. So, yeah. you know, that's, that's one thing I always tell them. If it's nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 pressure, go for the counter drop because yeah, it, it obviously needs to be a little bit like, it can't be a loose ball. Maybe you go defensive drop then like we talked about to buy yourself time. And if it's maybe like an eight out of 10 pressure and the, then the tactical stuff, like you mentioned, if the guy's right behind you or something like that, then it's let's maybe even try to reverse this pressure and hit that lob and win the point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, awesome, awesome. N nice to hear that I'm not crazy. <laughs> and I'm not... <laughs> uh... Yeah, it depends. But uh, for me, like it depends on how you are physically as well and yes. uh, how you can go quicker on the ball. And for example, like Ali Farag is doing a lot of lob on the yes. front is like like so good at it and uh, it's a great strength you have and uh, we use it very well and i think i'm trying to do it as well Amazing. but uh, like uh, i know like because i'm fast i can use the speed to get the ball go higher and right. uh, i knew like like on this shot i would have been able to just lob it and okay. i'm going quick on the ball and just with a little movement just mm -hmm. Love it. And, right. Uh, well, actually, tell us more about that. That's an interesting thing that you mentioned. So when we talk about technique, tell us a little bit about what you mean. Use the movement with a little with a little bit. Tell us about that. But I know like I using like my speed like on this to just or whatever counter drop or mm -hmm. lob like uh, I'm going fast to the ball, then dissolate. And with the energy I use to go to the ball, I use this to make my shot uh, every shot. I mean, even Amazing. boast or anything. And that's how we can uh, play uh, with a short preparation, using the legs and uh, all the energy you you use to go to the ball. And then you can uh, do whatever you want if you have the control enough of your racket. 
Amazing. And I think that's that's the goal, the main goal. Like you can do anything you want in every position, and uh, that's the main goal. Amazing, man. I wanna I wanna give you some respect for explaining that <laughs> the way nice. you explain that because that was awesome. It's like one of the things that I'm always talking to people about when they are at a high enough level to when they're technically at a decent place, then we have to talk about flow of movement and energy transfer. So what guys, for what Sebastian said, for anyone who didn't quite understand what he said, because it's a complicated thing, is that he's using the speed of his movement and he's using energy from the ground up to transfer that force into the ball. And he doesn't have to do that much with the racket in order to extend and transfer that energy into the ball and direct it wherever he wants. So he could be under a tremendous amount of pressure over there and he might need to only do this with his racket at the end of that, but it's the whole momentum of his speed and then the shoulder extending and the forearm extending and then the little pop with the wrist even at the end is what transfers all that energy into that law. Yeah. So a lot of people make the mistake of getting on a ball and then getting stuck and then swinging, and now you've lost all your momentum and you're having to regenerate all this energy and it's never the same. And then it's also, and then some people will swing and then they'll stop before they move back. But we always wanna have this like synchronous, constantly flowing movement when we're playing squash and just timing that of, you know, stepping and accelerating your swing and following through and pushing back with the momentum of the follow through, things like that. It's it's a skill that most people don't realize and don't have, but it's such an important skill, even just from a, the standpoint of conservation of energy, because if you have to use energy to get to a ball, lose that energy, reinitiate energy, lose it, reinitiate to get back to the T, it's just so inefficient. So I, I'm really happy that you explained that in detail. So thank you for that. Yeah, no worries. I mean, I'm still trying to improve this because it's, it's not easy, but... Yeah. This is the goal, like for everyone, I think, uh, to be able to play uh, any shot in every position and uh, yes. have a full control of uh, everything. But if I can do this, uh, I will be uh, going up on the ranking. You'll so, be world number 10 in no time. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you know, and one of the things in that back left corner, you know, when you're going open stance, trying to force that cross court. Yeah. I think this energy transfer piece is is really missing over there. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially in open stance in that back corner. And the only reason I know that is because I do exactly what you did and yeah. it feels like crap every time I do it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get power on my shot. It's never accurate enough. And my recovery back to the T is not there. So I, for me, I know that my timing as I'm stepping my rotation and my step and my release of my swing is not quite there. And I'm not snapping enough as crisply as I need to. And that's why it's not going through my spacing gets thrown off a little bit over there as well. So this is something that I need to work on a ton in that corner as well. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere, but especially in that corner. Yeah. I need to, I think so as well. Yeah. That's that, good yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then, well, there was one example of mental fatigue I'll just show and you, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about over here. It was that, that high boast. Yeah, unnecessary high boast. And that's one that everyone is so guilty of. I used to do this all the time. You just, you know, you don't really know what to do. And then you just put in like a weak boast. And then the other guy yeah. just chops you up for that. And like, the, and this is what you were saying, Kandra is so strong on that forehand. And when you give him that loose ball, he has infinite options. And he's so deceptive yeah. that trickle boast comes in like, we just can't move. Yeah, exactly what you said. Like, uh, I didn't know what to do. I was mentally fatigued, like, uh, I think okay, just I just play a boss, but I didn't think about the boss. Like yeah, but yeah, yeah. It just it just happens. Like you don't know what you're doing, and you just like hit this shot, and then right after you hit it, you're like, "What the heck did I just do? Why did I hit that yeah. shot?" And you're like, you're yeah. standing on the tee cursing yourself because you're like, "Okay, now I have to be so ready to cover every ball." And when you're playing guys at that level, like I mean, you can be as ready as you want, but they're so deceptive and hit so accurately that chances are it's going to be hard to pick that next shot up. Yeah, exactly. All right. And I, I want to end the, the, the videos over here on an awesome rally. Got to, got to end with some awesome stuff as well. So this was at the end of game two for everyone that's watching. So see over here, I felt like 
you're actually doing better to keep the ball a bit straighter and resetting right there, like open yeah. stance, resetting. You weren't forcing the cross as much. Over there, interestingly enough, I felt like your technique was, see, and this is why, like, even when you did hit it a little bit more accurately, you see, you still look like you're a little bit too close to the ball. Yeah. So I feel like two footed backhand, I feel like there is a technical thing where maybe you got to work a bit on the judgment and the spacing. Um, yeah. You did execute it a little bit more effectively over here, though, and it got past him because you got yeah, better. Yeah. yeah, that was much better. Um, and then this was the awesome part here. So, you know, you set up patterns of attacking short on the volley, on the backhand volley, yeah. and then you suddenly use that wrist to go cross and see Kandra's movement is coming to that front left because that's the pattern that he's used to. And then all of a sudden, you just broke that pattern and then uh, there's, there's no real recovery because you also got a great angle and the ball faded into the side wall. So that was... I think quality, really, really quality on that. And for me, yeah, for sure. you're right. For me, it all stemmed from the fact that you were hitting the ball straight in this backhand. See, there is one straight, cl close stance straight, or open stance straight, nice straight kill trying to squeeze him, open stance under pressure. That's the big one. See, in, the, in many of your other rallies from this position, yeah. this is where you're trying to force the cross. See, right there. And that looks like Mohamed El Shorbagi's technique. And that was uh, yeah. that was awesome. So I'm watching and, every day. So. Yeah, yeah. And that's that reset, me. right? Like, and I think this is where you're talking, like the mental thing. If you think about, you know, what separates you from the like top ten, top twenty, yeah. it's make it's being patient enough, having the confidence in these positions to know that hey, I just need to reset it. I have the fitness, I have yeah. the ball control. I just need to reset it and wait for a better opportunity because that's what all these top guys do. Like you, you watch Shravagi all the time. He, from that position resets like almost everything straight. And he has no issue doing that 10 times in a row if he has to, because he's just like, of I'm going to get that opportunity and I'm going to take it when I get it. Yeah, of course. Every time he's really sitting with a good drive and a good lens yeah. and uh, Mustafa as well is doing it. Yeah. Mustafa's good. doing that extremely well too. You're right. Backhand. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love it. I love it. Well, what I want to get, Sebastian, thoughts on everything we talked about today. How do you feel? I'm feeling good. It's, uh, it's nice to share. I mean, uh, if I can help uh, anyone else uh, for, for getting better and uh, I'm enjoying it, so that's cool. I love it. You know, we're gonna I'm going to have to watch one of your matches again uh, from another tournament so that I can get like another perspective on, uh, on your game on a different court. Maybe hopefully you're a bit more settled and stuff. And then uh, we should do another one of these calls again. Yeah, of course, of course, we can do it. That'll be like, amazing. I will play. I will play more tournaments now in uh, big events. So, yeah, that's cool. When is the next one? Detroit. Uh, okay. Next week, actually. Oh, amazing. Twenty uh, sixth January. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you know who you're up against so far? First round. Uh, Patrick Rooney. Okay. 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 Nice. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. I love it. Well, and for any of you guys watching, um, I hope this gave you a flavor. Well, I know for sure if you watch this, you're going to learn a ton about squash <laughs> because we talked about a lot of technical yeah. stuff, a lot of mindset, a lot of tactical stuff. I would probably watch it a couple of times over if, uh, if you are watching this and you're keen about the game. And uh, for any of you guys who do want to potentially work with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis, with the video analysis, uh, setting up your plan, making everything holistically possible, positive and possible for you, send me an email at uh, ahadarperformance.com and we'll see what we can do for you. So Sebastian, how are you feeling, man? Anything else on your mind? Anything you want to talk about? Uh, or maybe we can call it a day. I think uh, we talk about uh, a lot of things and uh, squash and even outside of squash. And uh, yeah, so I, I love think it. I think we 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 good man. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, awesome. let's let's say bye to everyone. Thanks again for being here, Sebastian. I really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. That's important. And uh, to like the video. Yeah. Uh, I, thank you. And may, maybe we'll have Sebastian. Maybe we'll have you on as uh, as as a frequent guest, uh, analyzing some of your games, kind of like we did today. I think of it course, might be really course. helpful. I'm for it. Yeah, sure, sure. I'm enjoying it. Awesome. All right, guys, everyone have a great day and uh, we'll right. talk to you soon. Take care. See you. Bye. Take care.